the Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, our friendly neighborhood Ayuka, where uh, we always try to uh, get you access to some of the uh, great scientists who visit us and who give, give you a chance to interact with them live on stage here during our public lecture series. So we, of course, uh, also tie up with a lot of organizations so that we can get access to any such speakers. So today is one such event, although it has happened at a slightly short notice. Uh, we po apologize for that. But uh, we have managed to get an uh, eminent speaker and an expert in the subject that he's going to introduce you to. So we would uh, like to start the program by first uh, introducing our co-host, the British Council here in India. And for that, I would uh, welcome Savitri to say a few words and Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Savitri Ayer, Manager of Operations and Customer Service, British Council, Pune. On behalf of the British Council, I would like to thank you for taking your time to be pre uh, present today here. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the first of our great talk on ancient light, the microwave background radiation and cosmology by Professor Mark Birkinshaw. The British Council is UK's international organization for cultural relations and educational opportunities. We create friendly knowledge and understanding between the people of the UK and other countries. We do this by making a positive contribution to the UK and the countries we work with, changing lives by creating opportunities, building connections, and engendering trust. Thank you, and I hope you do enjoy today's session. Thank you, Savitri. May I now request uh, our director, Professor Shomak Rai Choudhury, to come up on stage to introduce our speaker, Professor Mark Birkinshaw. Well, good evening. Thank you very much for, uh, for attending our, uh, our New Year's first uh, uh, talk in, uh, in the set of public lectures that we have. Here at Ayuka. This one is part of the series that, um, as you heard, we are hosting with uh, the British Council. We have some very close links with the British Council, uh, where we set up a monthly um, Cafe Scientifique like um, uh, series uh, uh, at the British Council campus. Uh, very recently, you might have heard about it, and if you haven't, please explore um, these, uh, these talks that are being held there. And also, of the series of uh, speakers that are being brought. Um, to India from Britain, um, I'm very happy to host uh, uh, a, a series of lectures that will be held here. The, this is the first of them this year. Also, it is an absolute privilege for me to have Professor Mark Birkinshaw um, visit uh, as one of these uh, speakers uh, in this series. Um, Professor Birkinshaw is a very old friend of mine. We've uh, worked together for a long time. Um, uh, he started his career at uh, uh, the Mallard Radio Astronomy Observatory in Cambridge. Uh, that is this in the good old um, uh, radio astronomy group uh, in Cambridge, which um, did quite a lot of the early work in bringing radio astronomy into the domain of galaxies and cosmology. A and, and Mark, um, um, of course, did his work there. And then uh, he was also, l later in life, a fellow of Gondwin Keyes College. But then uh, he spent quite a lot of his life in the US first uh, in Berkeley as a Miller Fellow, um, and then um, at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, working um, for the Chandra X-ray satellite um, as one of their staff scientists. That's where um, I overlap with him the most, um, and that's where I used to work as well around the same time. Then um, uh, he came back in uh, 1995 to England um, at the University of Bristol, where they were starting um, uh, astronomy uh, as part of the physics uh, the department of physics and he became the first professor of uh, astrophysics at Bristol and led the group and built a very very strong group um, of astrophysics one of the leading groups in in the UK um, at Bristol um, the distinction of uh, professor Birkinshaw is that he spans a lot of astrophysics even though he started off um, as a radio astronomer there isn't a branch of uh, 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 astrophysics where uh, in, in the extragalactic domain, at least, where you can't, you know, can't put up uh, a point finger and say he hasn't worked there. Um, 
but uh, his current interests in uh, cosmology in general, galaxy formation, clusters of galaxies, groups of galaxies, radio galaxies, uh, in using um, X-ray um, and uh, radio microwave observations um, um, are some of his core interests, and of course that spans into all kinds of things. Uh, he was telling me this morning of his current work on plasma physics as well. So um, it is really a pleasure to, um, to welcome Professor Birkinshaw. Um, I see um, the, the auditorium is slowly filling up, which is great news in the middle of the week to see a lot of you have come uh, to, to, for this talk. He's going to talk about the cosmic microwave background. Um, I'd like to welcome Professor Clark Birkinshaw to stage. Thanks very much. It looks like the uh, technology is already failing us, so let's see if we can uh, wake this thing up. May I request you to please make your mobile silent during the talk? Thank you. Very good. So thank you all again for, uh, for coming on such a busy day. My purpose over the next, well, depending on how slowly I speak, uh, 45 to 55 to 65 minutes, and I've been known to go on longer than that, uh, is to tell you something about the probably the single most important radiation field in the universe, which has uh, written on it much of the history of the universe and much astrophysics of nearby objects. And by nearby here, I mean things that are as close by as, say, 3,000 million light years away, which is not that far away in cosmology terms. Only back 10% uh, of the age of the universe to 20% of the age of the universe. So I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of a history about where the microwave background radiation came from, who discovered it, uh, a little bit about what the effect it's had has been, and then I'm going to go through the um, uh, performance and contributions that have been made by three satellites principally. The COBE satellite, the Cosmic Background Explorer, which started up this field of uh, rather precise cosmological measurements and the physics that can be deduced from them. And then the WMAP, the Wilkinson uh, Microwave and Isotropy Probe Satellite, that looked at a slightly smaller scale structure with more precision and uh, gives us much more uh, information about the structure of the universe. And then the most recent of the satellites, the Planck satellite, named after the scientist who uh, characterized the thermal radiation spectrum, which is the uh, type of color that the microwave background radiation has. So let's start with the discovery of the microwave background radiation was made by these two guys, Bob Wilson and Arna Penzias, using this ugly looking machine in the background. This is uh, a simple horn antenna where the end of the antenna has been twisted sideways so it can be pointed more easily. Uh, it's in New Jersey at a site called Crawford Hill, owned by the Bell Laboratories. Uh, no longer owned by the Bell Laboratories, I believe they sold that little bit off. These people were given the task by their supervisor of trying to explain why radio communications in the US was noisier than it should be. As people were sending signals from point to point, they were finding there was excess noise on those signals. And they uh, were given the use of this antenna to look to see if there was another source of radiation, of, um, radiation or other leakage that was coming in causing problems. One well, of the most obvious problem when they started up was about uh, 100 pounds of pigeon droppings that had accumulated in the antenna and had to be cleared out. After using a spade for a few days, uh, they managed to convince themselves that it was not pigeon droppings that were causing uh, excess radio noise, but instead there was an excess radio noise coming from the sky as a whole. It had fairly uniform brightness over the sky. In fact, the limits of their measurements, it was uniform. 
They could only observe at a single frequency, so they couldn't say what the spectrum was, but they uh, eventually persuaded themselves that this thing was important, was celestial, and needed reporting. One of the sets of people they reported it to, oh no, I'll come to them later, the radiation they saw at about four centimeters, four, yeah, about four gigahertz, that is 7.35 centimeters wavelength, the wavelength was about that. In other words, a wavelength that's so long you can measure it with a piece of string. Um, had been predicted. And they'd been predicted originally by George Gamow working with Ralph Alpha when they were looking at the origins of um, the elements in the universe. And they decided that if the universe started dense and hot, then there was the opportunity for fusion reactions to occur. And uh, you could perhaps make the heavy elements that we see around us carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc., etc. Um, George Gamow had a bit of a sense of humor, and so just rather than writing a paper by uh, Alpha and Gamow, they decided, well, why don't we ask uh, Hans Beta to be a member of the paper without telling him, and then we can call it the Alpha Beta Gamma paper. And so it's now known as the Alpha Beta Gamma paper, even though uh, Beta didn't actually know very much about it until it showed up. This paper predicted that that very hot early universe, after it expanded, would leave radiation lying around. And that radiation would be at a temperature around about 30 Kelvin. I think the number is about 40 Kelvin. Uh, Ralph Alpha moved to Johns Hopkins University from George Washington and started doing some work on cosmology with Robert Herman here. They improved on that calculation, although uh, Herman's contribution is often forgotten. And they said the original calculation was out by about a factor of 10. And there should be a residual radiation field, but it should be characteristic of radiation at a temperature of around about 4 Kelvin. 4 Kelvin radiation if of thermal origin, would have a rising spectrum through the radio, would peak in the millimeter range. In those days, millimeter astronomy was extraordinarily primitive, so it made sense to look for it in the radio. These people didn't try that, because he was a theoretician, he was a theoretician, he was a theoretician, and the definition of a theoretician is somebody who walks into a room and discovers that all the equipment Bob Dickey at Princeton with his students was both a theoretician and an observer. Uh, he invented various pieces of radio astronomy kit, uh, particularly the Dickey switch of uh, uh, famous usage, uh, had come across the prediction that there might be a thermal radiation in the universe, and he and his students were building a telescope to try to find it. Uh, when a phone call came in from Bell Labs, a few miles away, uh, saying we have this extra radiation we have discovered. Uh, Bob Dickey rather famously put the phone down, turned to his students, including David Wilkinson, said, we've been scooped, lads, and then binned the radio telescope from him. Uh, it was later revived, and they did some good work. Although they didn't win the Nobel Prize, unlike these two characters, they did write the interpretation paper that follows the discovery paper in Nature, explaining what it was that um, Penzias and Wilson had found. Now that brings me on, or rather back, to this character uh, from the Hearn University, and this is Alexander Friedman normally we write his name out in English characters with either one or two N's depending on uh, who we are more than anything else. This is the original Cyrillic. Friedman took Einstein's equations and applied them to the universe as a whole. 
and came up with the first working mathematical models for how the universe would expand. A modern solution for the expansion of the universe is shown on the right-hand side, where at time zero, that is the Big Bang, the universe starts very small. This is a measure of the size of the universe. At the present day, it's got size one, because that's how I scaled it. And into the future, it continues to expand. The shape of this curve initially shows fast expansion with a deceleration, curves downward. That deceleration occurs because the universe has got stuff in it, and stuff has gravity, and gravity tends to stop things escaping if you throw them away. A little while ago, where a little while ago means three or four billion years, the universe seems to have changed from a decelerating state to an accelerating state. That's the famous dark energy effect, the uh, uh, effect of the cosmological constant, for which a recent Nobel Prize was awarded. We will come back to that a little bit later on. So, the universe started small. It's fairly cool today. In other words, I'm not burning up. So it was hotter in the past than it is now. And around about 13.6 billion years ago, if you take that curve for the expansion of the universe and extrapolate back, you'll find that the universe was hot enough that hydrogen and helium in the universe were converted from neutral gas to plasma. The electrons were free of their nuclei and just buzzed around happily. If you have a plasma, then any radiation that lies in that plasma will be strongly coupled to the ionized gas. And if it's strongly coupled to gas at a given temperature, the radiation will be the characteristic radiation of that temperature. The temperature at which the universe would have changed to plasma was round about 3,000 Kelvin. Close enough, 3,000 degrees centigrade. And at 3,000 degrees, plasma, gas, radiates light, principally in the red and the infrared. As the universe expanded from that phase to the present, the matter changed from being ionized to being neutral. When it did that, the radiation lost all trace of the matter that it was supposed to be interacting with and changed temperature in its own way, which is different from the way that matter changes temperature. And radiation that started being in the optical in the infrared, when the universe expands by a factor of a thousand, changes from the infrared through to the submillimeter, the submillimeter, and the radio. So the radiation we are seeing today in the microwave background is leftover infrared and optical radiation from this very early phase of the universe that had just been stretched out by the universe as the universe had expanded and carried the radiation along with it. So the four Kelvin radiation we see today, we'll see a more accurate number shortly, lies at radio and millimeter wavelengths, and is this ancient light, this stuff from plasma very early on. And the people I've been talking about described the case of Friedman, the expansion, causes the peak wavelength to increase, predicted the temperature using that expansion based on the alpha, beta, gamma paper about the beginnings of nuclei in the universe that led to a prediction that one should look in the radio and it was discovered by accident by some people excavating pigeon guano from an antenna in New Jersey. Before I go on, just a word about how the expansion rate is measured. Astronomers always talk about redshift. And we use redshift in two ways, uh, as a measure of distance and as a measure of time. What redshift really is, is a measure of the stretching of radiation. And that stretching of radiation is this scale factor. The amount the universe has expanded is from one time to another to another. Redshift zero, by definition, is the present time. 
if I look at this equation, that says that 1 is the ratio of the scales back to today's to the scales back to today, which makes sense. In the past, the redshift was very large because the scale factor was much smaller than the scales back to today. In the future, as the universe expands, the scale factor will increase, and it might increase as far as infinity. When it does so, this redshift will change to minus 1. So positive redshifts are in the past, negative redshifts are in the future, and just like um, ordinary people, we never actually reach our future, we're always in the present at which the redshift is zero, which makes the redshift a little bit confusing. The time at which the universe had a certain scale also tracks with the redshift. So if I talk about redshift 2, that's when the universe had half its present scale. And if I plot how that time relates to redshift here, redshift 2 corresponds to a time about 10 billion years ago. If you look at this curve, as redshift becomes very large, you gradually approach a fixed time around about 13.7 billion years ago, which is the age of the universe. inadvertently say redshift, think time, and think of that plot. And here I've inadvertently spoken about redshift immediately. And this is a physics curve showing how the temperature of matter and radiation in the universe changes as redshift changes. From a redshift around about 3 times 10 to the 8, which is 10 seconds after the Big Bang, to redshift 0, which is today. Matter and radiation stayed together in temperature up to the time at which the matter became neutral, and then they change in different ways because matter and radiation are slightly different things. Radiation temperature today is in fact 2.728 degrees. The baryon temperature, the temperature of matter, should be about 1 1,000th of that, according to this model. This model is wrong because I did this model and I'm a cosmologist and I didn't want to worry about the difficulty involved in putting in how galaxies and stars and other things formed in the universe. And when you take cold stuff, gravity tends to pull it together into dense lumps. And dense lumps of cold stuff become stars and stars have got a nice way of heating themselves up by changing hydrogen into helium and the heavier elements and emitting ionizing radiation, which then hits the gas near it and reheats it. So this baryon temperature curve, the temperature of stuff, should come down and then turn up as stars form and then go to what its current value is. And most of the matter in the universe is now at a temperature of around about 10 million degrees. In other words, it's become ionized again. But it's very thinly spread out because the universe has expanded a lot from ancient times here. And that expansion has counteracted the temperature and means that the microwave background radiation is still not interacting very strongly. So when we look at the microwave background radiation, we're getting a very good snapshot of what was going on here hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, with a little bit of interference from what's been going on more recently after structure formed. And that interplay between structure formation and the large-scale uh, history of the universe is what makes the microwave background radiation so interesting. Okay, that's the big picture. If you're going to do science, it's good to come up with big pictures, but we'd better check them. So let's do the odd check of the uh, fairy story I've just told you. The first interesting check would be to say, if we have this radiation, and we know it comes from the sky, how far away from us in the sky does it come from? The measurements that uh, Penzias and Wilson made only said, well, it comes from outside the solar system. But if it's telling us something about the universe as a whole, it should be coming from a good deal further away than that. 
So can we find objects whose distance we know that are casting shadows on them? Because that then tells us a least distance away from us at which they lie. The second question we can ask is, is the radiation that we're seeing really a thermal radiation? Penzias and Wilson only looked at one wavelength. But if it's going to be thermal, it's got to have the right spectrum across all the whole range of wavelengths, it's got to behave the right way. So we ought to go out and test. And finally, is the background radiation entirely uniform? If it comes from this point-like explosion of the universe, which is then expanded out, then it should really be pretty uniform. But, I notice I'm not falling through the floor, so the floor is fairly solid. The universe today has definite structure. It's got galaxies and clusters of galaxies and other things in it. That structure formed by gravitational collapse. And if you follow through the theory of gravitational collapse, which I'm delighted to say I'm not going to do today, you will find that for things to be lumpy today, they had to be significantly lumpy back at the time when the microwave background radiation and the plasma lost track of one another about 100,000 years after the Big Bang. So the radiation should be almost entirely uniform, but it ought to be a little bit lumpy. And that lumpiness ought to have the pattern that could be responsible for the structure that we know and love today. So let's start by looking for shadows. And I started by looking for shadows because that's where my career started. If we have a large amount of hot gas between ourselves and this time 100,000 years after the Big Bang, then just as you had before that time, radiation can interact with that hot gas. The radiation that's coming in would have a characteristic temperature of a few Kelvin. The hot gas would have the characteristic characteristics of that temperature. Now, clusters of galaxies are very large mass assemblies that hold large amounts of hot gas in them. That gas is up to 10 or 15, 15 kilo electron volts in temperature. That is to say, it's got a temperature of up to about uh, 20 million Kelvin which is a lot hotter than the radiation that it is. And if you pass cold radiation through hot stuff it can interact with, then the radiation is slightly warmed up. So if we take a nice Planck spectrum and add a little bit of energy to the photons, where the spectrum is rising, the intensity of the spectrum drops. Where the spectrum is falling, the intensity of the spectrum goes up. So in the radio wave band, that is up to around about 150 gigahertz, you will see a diminution in the brightness of the microwave background radiation. And above about 150 gigahertz, you'll see an increase. This thing's called the Smyrzelovich effect, after uh, Rashid Smyrzelov and uh, Jakob Zeldovich, who uh, did some of the fundamental work on how matter and radiation interact in the universe. Typical radio sources are completely different spectra, doesn't behave the same way. And um, a paper that uh, Shomak so kindly referred to, but has been extremely heavily cited, is one that measured slight decreases in the brightness of the microwave background radiation in the directions of some well-known high redshift clusters of galaxies and show that the radiation had to originate behind those clusters. And this was the first demonstration that the microwave background radiation really, really had to be at a very high redshift. You can make the same statement by saying, well, if it's made up of lots of individual sources, how far away can those sources be? But this was the uh, thing that showed further away than certainly redshift 0.5. These shadows, I should say, are 
brought one to send shadows, but very faint shadows indeed. These are quite a hard one. These days it's a much easier project, and people make maps of the shadows. And these are shadows of clusters ranging from a range of 0.2 to about 1. That is relatively close to us, say 300 million light years, out to rather less close to us, say uh, 2 billion light years. They will look very similar. Okay, that establishes that the radiation field is genuinely a distant radiation field. Let's now see if we can say something about its lumpiness and its spectrum in the next two tests. And the COBE satellite was designed to make those tests. It had three instruments on it of uh, particular interest, but only two that I'm going to talk about today. The uh, DMR, the Differential Microwave Radiometer, and I must say that in the middle lot because it's pretty much a mouthful, and the FIRAS, the Far Infrared Astronomical Absolute Spectrograph. I keep saying astronomical as uh, absolute spectrograph. This thing has two horns on it which look in different directions it operates by looking at the difference in brightness between those two different directions and recording that different signal and sending it down to the ground. As the satellite rotates and uh, tumbles around the sky, you gradually build up a mass of the entire sky and can look to see if there's any lump in it. The spectrometer here, the spectrograph, measures the temperature difference between the sky and this thing over and stick in the air. This thing is a uh, perfect, in inverted commas, emitter of radio waves at a temperature of around about 3 Kelvin. And the difference signal between that and what comes in through the horn collector when you take the, the, uh, the hat off would be a measure of the spectrum signal. I should say that um, this is a moving part, and if you put moving parts in orbit, things tend to go wrong. And the COBE scientists were so worried about this that about the first thing they did in orbit was make the measurement with fire ass, uh, putting the cap on and off, and then breathing a sigh of relief that it actually worked. This thing uh, has no moving parts and is therefore deemed reliable. So what did FIRAS find? In about 15 minutes it measured this. Uh, the data points are so small they lie underneath the blue line and you can't see them. And the blue line is a theoretical thermal spectrum. In other words, FIRAS measured the microwave background radiation to be a perfect black body radiating spectrum. And uh, John Mather shared the Nobel Prize for that. Unfortunately, that pre predicted was an entire failure because the measurements they took were difference measurements between the brightness of the radiator stuck on top in the sky, and they've added those that radiator's theoretical spectrum back on in order to get the data points they plotted. The difference data looks a lot like that, but still is extraordinarily close to a perfect thermal spectrum. So the microwave background really is thermal, and you can measure its temperature quite precisely from here. It comes up to about 2.7 degrees per Kelvin, which is a good deal better than the original measurement, or the original theoretical prediction. How about the lumpiness of the sky? Kobe measured the lumpiness of the sky, and the basic data shows the sky is uniform. It has a brightness of about 2.73 Kelvin. George Smoot got the Nobel Prize for that, and this also is a complete fake because the DMR device only measures differentially. It can't measure the integrated spectrum, and they've added it back in to make that pretty picture which shows what the sky looks like. If you remove the thing they added back in, what you get is this. This is the non-uniformity. 
it is more than one part in a thousand, because this is now millikilovolts and not kelvins. And it's got a very strong pattern to it. It basically shows any Chinese in here? I believe that's yin yang in Mandarin. Uh, a yin and a yang pattern. That is dipole pattern. Bright on one side and cool on the other side. That bright cool pattern is what you get if you take um, uh, a measurement of from a moving platform. If you're going in one direction, the direction you're moving in sees a Doppler shift that puts frequency up, and it puts intensity up. And the other side, the intensity goes down and the frequency goes down. So this measurement that's brighter over here and cooler down there shows you're moving towards that point. And the amplitude here tells you that we're moving at 400 kilometers per second at that point. Now that's actually the motion of a satellite. And that is essentially the motion of the Earth. But the Earth is rotating in the galaxy. And if you take account of that, you find that the total motion of our galaxy is about 600 kilometers per second. So our galaxy is really running around. There's some bits of this that don't look quite Doppler-like, uh, Doppler -like, so not quite dipole pattern. There's a lump there, for example. Another lump there. Well, this plot is of the entire sky, a sort of a, uh, a map of the sky, where the North Pole is there, the South Pole is there, and East and West between uh, here and here, and then it links around behind your head. of the plane as being that of the plane of the galaxy. So this lumpiness that tends to lie along the plane of the galaxy is radio emission from our own galaxy, which is totally uninteresting if you're interested in cosmology, and utterly fascinating if you're a galactic astronomer. Well, let's subtract off the yin-yang pattern, because we know what that's got to be, and see what's left. Now I've rescaled it so that this is a peak color scale of plus or minus about 20 microkelvin. Down by another factor of about 100. The galaxy is incredibly bright. It's burned out this red streak across the middle. And we can get absolutely no information about the universe as a whole from the COBE data in those directions. Above and below the galaxy, we see lumpiness. Need lumpiness in the microwave background radiation because we're going to have structure today. So we can declare victory. Well, not quite, because the lumpiness that your eye sees here is noise. And the true lumpiness on the sky is a subtle statistical pattern that lies within that noise. This is mostly measurement noise. There's a little bit of reality which biases the noise so that. This side seems to be a little bit brighter than that side. Now, COBE operated up to about 1993, and the results that were coming out of COBE was evident very early on. It was going to require follow-up satellites. The WMAP satellite was um, designed and built by the USA. The Planck satellite was designed and built uh, in Europe, and there were a number of other Going down the time scale, WMAP improved on COBE, Planck improved on WMAP, and the ground projects were all over the place depending on how much people uh, put in by way of effort, money, and uh, good thinking. I've been talking about um, this pattern of lumpiness, and the pattern of lumpiness having to be there so that structure can form in the way that models show us structure forms by a gravitational collapse. And this is a simulation which takes very faint fluctuations in the density field early on, and then lets the universe expand and looks at how gravity moves those fluctuations around. Over time, you end up with something that can look like quite a large galaxy or galaxy cluster and diffuse regions around it. 
that rate of growth, it turns out, for most of the age of the universe, goes only proportionally to 1 plus z. So between a redshift of 1,000, when matter and radiation lost track of one another in the present, the universe's density fluctuation should only have grown by about a factor of 1,000, plus a bit of nonlinear growth later. So you would expect that on the very large scale, microwave background radiation should show lumpiness about one part in a thousand. But if we go back to the CODI data, the fluctuations are less than that. Why are they less than that? Well, it's because the assumptions I made, as I told you about, aren't quite right. The universe didn't suddenly, like that, change from being neutral, uh, from being ionized to being neutral. There is a delay, a slow change over there. And that somewhat smears out the behavior. The very early fluctuations that were in there can be thought of as sound waves. Sound waves in a self-gravitating gas. So sound waves modified by gravity that wants to make the gravitational waves, the, the sound waves collapse. Another paper that uh, Rashid uh, Sinyaev and Yakov Zeldovich wrote looked at how fluctuations in the very early universe would have grown, then changed into sound waves, and then grown again later. This is um, uh, figure one of their 1970 paper about the fluctuations in the microwave background radiation that would result from that. And what it shows, well, I'll let you read it for yourselves, is that um, structure grows up to a certain time here, then it changes into sound waves which oscillate up to the time when the universe becomes neutral, when they have got different amplitudes depending on how long they've had to grow early on, and different phases. That is, at recombination, when the universe went neutral, we expect to see a pattern of waves on the sky of different scales each distinct scale, each distinct angular scale, having a different amplitude and a different phase. That pattern of amplitudes and phases is predictable. So we can predict what the pattern of fluctuations that we get on the sky should be. And the great measurement from COBE and later satellites is what that pattern of fluctuations is. Here's the COBE picture. I can change the picture into a statistical plot that shows those fluctuations. And here it is. This plot is going to recur several times, so I'd better explain it. This is the theoretical pattern of noisiness on the sky as a function of multi it says that on a scale of 200 in this hectometer L, you get a big peak, you get a lot of fluctuation. That says that on an angular scale of about one degree, you get a lot of patchiness on the sky. The angle is at roughly 180 divided by this parameter L. L of two corresponds to a scale of 90 degrees. L of one corresponds to 180 degrees. We've already seen the 180 degree pattern, that's the dipole, the motion that I said the uh, galaxy has through the universe. COBE was a relatively small instrument and could only measure up to dipole, uh, up to about the L equals 20 multipole, which is this very boring part of the curve. All the interest is surely here, where you get these enormous fluctuations. And the WMAP and Planck satellites were intended to explore those. Those oscillations tell us quite a lot. The angular scale at which the first peak arises tells you whether the universe is flat or curved. That is, if you draw a triangle in the universe, what's the sum of the angles in that triangle? If the universe is flat, like a piece of paper, the sum of the angles in the triangle is 180 degrees. 
If the universe was positively curved like a balloon or a sphere, the sum of the angles in the triangle is greater than 180 degrees. Think of a line that goes from the North Pole down to the equator, then around 90 degrees on the equator and back up to the North Pole. The sum of the interior angles is then 90 degrees plus 90 degrees plus 90 degrees or 270 degrees, or certainly greater than 180. Or if the curvature is the other way around, negative, the sum of the interior angles will be less than 180 degrees. I'm not going to try to describe what the shape of that object is because it can't exist in our universe. The spectrum also depends on what the universe is made up of. The heights of the peaks tell you how much of the matter in the universe is in the form of ordinary stuff or this dark matter stuff which is supposed to be responsible for most of the universe's gravity. And the shapes of the peaks test the theory of gravity. The, the, uh, uh, the amount of their width essentially tells you something about uh, whether general relativity and perturbations on general relativity are right. Covey, as I've just shown you, measured the amount of noise, but um, didn't really get the shape. Schematically, it made a picture of the sky that looks like that. When you put a telescope on a satellite, you can get a map of the sky that looks like that. Or if you spend a bit longer and a bit more, you can get a map of the sky that looks like that. Going from Covey to W map back. And here's what W map looks like. It has a real telescope and a sun shield and was floating well away from the Earth at the so-called Lagrangian L2 point, where the Earth and the Sun are always in much the same direction from the satellite. This is very convenient because it means that the moment you point away from that direction, you don't have people's mobile phones, television broadcasts, and uh, solar flares and things like that mucking up your radio signal protect against that by putting a nice big shield on your body. And uh, you can also put solar panels on the bottom of the shield to cover them with power. This satellite flew at L2. Uh, when it stopped working, when it was turned off after nine years, it was uh, deorbited from L2 because L2 is a very popular place for astronomy satellites and it's getting a little bit crowded. And it's now in a um, solar orbit in, oh, I don't know, maybe a few hundred million years. It might come around, hit the Earth or the Moon. So I don't think we need to worry about that. WMAP used the same sort of differential technique to make a map of the sky. And its maps of the sky are here in five bands, ranging from 20 gigahertz to 90 gigahertz. You can see the galaxy is extremely prominent in all the bands, but also that at the higher frequencies, there's a fair bit of sky that doesn't look so badly contaminated. If you subtract what you think the galaxy is doing to you from all of those maps, you get the pictures on the right. Obviously, what you think the galaxy is doing is wrong in the K band. So what you decide to do is to say, forget the strip along the galactic plane. Let me make my cosmological measurements more than, say, 10 or 15 degrees off plane and see what that perturbation spectrum looks like. Here's the best picture of what the fluctuations on the sky look like after subtracting the model and combining all the frequencies. And I think even by eye, you can see that there's some structuring on here which doesn't look entirely round. Beam size is very small, it's called the scale of a couple of pixels on the, the image. So the individual up down lumpiness on the very small scale tells you what the noise is. But to my eye at least, there's a sort of a continent here with mountain peaks, and there's a sort of an ocean there which is lower. So there is a lot of large scale structure that you can now start to pick out by eye. That is, the measurement noise is smaller than the signal that you're trying to measure, which 
is usually happening. The saturation spectrum that results is here. You've got the first peak, you've got the second peak, you've got the third peak. And that's enough to tell you something about the um, flatness of the universe and the constituents of the universe. The data points are plotted, they lie very close to the curve throughout. That's the seven year data, the nine year data that you can see. There's a shaded area down here, which uh, I've marked on this version of it as cosmic variance. The problem is that if you go out and measure the sky, one sky is all you've got. So if we happen to be in a not particularly um, representative part of the universe, then you might measure the wrong sky. And you've got to take account of the fact that somebody else somewhere else in the universe will see something different. So in addition to the measurement there's an extra noise due to uncertainty as to whether or not we're in a totally random place in the universe, or a totally good place in the universe. The universe is just too small. Um, if you can find us a bigger one, that would be very helpful. If you then fit this curve and try to downweight a little bit of misfitting, measure a number of important cosmological parameters. The amount of ordinary stuff in the universe, about 2% of the so-called critical density. The amount of cold stuff in the universe, around about 11% of the critical density. The amount of cosmological constant in the universe, which is driving the current acceleration. And a few other parameters. It's interesting, though, I think that you only need seven parameters to fit this extreme wiggly thing, and that there are seven important numbers that describe the universe that we're in. One of the numbers in there, tau, about 0 0.09, says that when the matter and radiation in the universe lost track of one another, they didn't completely lose track. 9% of the uh, radiation actually got um, dumped on later on a little bit and changed its uh, property slightly. Now, in addition to um, this brightness structure on the universe that uh, we get through the microwave background radiation, there's one other piece of information you can try to extract, which is polarization. Radio waves are nicely polarized, just like optical waves stick a bit of Polaroid on the front of your radio telescope to see whether the radio waves are going up and down or to and fro. Well, on the sky it doesn't really make sense to do that. We tend to split it in a different way, into so-called E modes and B modes. You can think of E modes as being sort of up-down type things, and B modes as being sort of circular type things. That's quite good enough for description for now. Uh, WMAP could measure E mode, but only by its correlation with the unpolarized signal. And this is that correlation. There is a theoretical curve plotted in here which tracks very nicely what the measurements are. So there is polarization. Polarization tells you something slightly different, it isn't measured terribly well. Okay, let's go on to the next generation, the Planck satellite, launched slightly later had more, more and better detectors and a bigger telescope than uh, WMAP. It had better protection against foreground signals because of the more frequencies, and it added some extra polarization capture. It made some very pretty maps of the entire sky. These are those same sort of difference maps that I was showing you for WMAP, now in nine bands. And I don't know about you, but when I first look at this, I get depressed. What depresses me is that um, where in the WMAP data the galaxy just lay in a thin strip across the middle, here I can see galactic radiation going all the way up towards the pole. So there's some galactic contamination 
of what we're trying to measure, the cosmology, the real universe, all over the, all over the sky. However, because you've got a lot of different frequencies, you can measure that contamination and correct for it. And when you make a corrective decontaminating measure, you get a picture which looks like this. Actually, you get a picture that looks a lot better than this. This picture is seriously degraded because I'm showing it to you. Because the projector that we're using doesn't have anything like the resolution that's required, and uh, my computer doesn't have anything like the storage that I would use to save a decent copy of the picture. So this is a heavily degraded version of what the bank data shows. But if you think back, the WMAP picture I showed you, it looks very similar. You've got a continent out here and a sort of sea in the middle. So it's seeing the same sort of structure. Two things immediately follow. First thing, you got it right when you measured the W map because we duplicated the experiment and got the same result. We have done science and not just um, held a thumb up in the air. Second thing, we just measured the same thing as W map, so we're not going to win any Nobel Prizes. However, the measurement is a lot better than W maps. The spectrum is now followed out beyond the third thumb into the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh thumbs. The measurement errors are smaller. The satellite was extremely well calibrated eventually. That was um, a serious piece of work. In fact, so much data came down from the bank that everything involved in the data set was a serious piece of work. Uh, and we can now try to fit this spectrum to see what parameters come out. The Planck parameters and the WMAP parameters can be compared, and they agree spectacularly well. In other words, the shape of that curve is now one of the best known cosmological facts in the universe. And it tells us about the universe, which is very satisfying. It tells us very precisely how much ordinary stuff and dark stuff there are, what an average cosmological constant there is, that there is stuff that's getting in the way, and that the universe is 13.796 billion years old. Happy birthday at this point is not required because we don't know the day. Interestingly, one number that stands out from astronomy is this one. The Hubble constant appears to be around about 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which is not quite what optical astronomers measure. They tend to measure a number that's slightly larger. Planck actually went further. Because Planck has higher angular resolution than WMAP, you can make little pictures of interesting parts of the sky and find out some new facts. One of those facts has to do with, again, structure formation. Radiation only travels at the speed of light, broadly. So if you take a lump of stuff that is, say, 3 billion light years across, say 3 million light years across, more realistic. It will take the light 3 million years to cross it. If that thing is a forming, gravitationally um, a collapsing object like a cluster of galaxies, as the light goes through, the cluster will have contracted a little bit, which means that the light drops into a shallower gravitational potential, then it clambers up or down the out of at the end. In dropping into a gravitational potential well, light gets blue shifted. In clambering out of a gravitational potential well, it gets red shifted. So what this is saying is that we should be able to look at clusters of galaxies and say the radiation should be a little bit cooler in those directions than it is in others because it had a harder job getting out than it had getting in. And if we conversely, if we look in places where there aren't very many galaxies, the opposite should be true because voids in the universe tend to want to expand.
this cost is flat. And this shows you that towards clusters and voids, you see different patterns. And this is an indication that this structure formation effect, or the integral of sense order effect, is indeed present. And you have to take account of some precise measurements of the structure. Another thing that's present, I'm delighted to say, is the Sinyosa Burbage effect, the thing that I started with. This is the uh, Frank measurement of the Sinyosa Burbage effect towards the so called Shapti supercluster, which is an assembly of clusters of galaxies that's so large that there is gas between the clusters as well as in the individual cluster. There's the tail of gas showing up. So, microwave background astronomy, starting in the 1960s, has, particularly with the aid of the recent satellites WRAP and Planck, produced some stunning cosmological results. Let me summarize what I've spoken about. First, you get a hot big bang because the microwave background sky is extremely uniform. The pattern of fluctuations on that uniform background is just the say the right sort of thing you need to form clusters of galaxies. Hooray, we can explain why they're here. You only really need six parameters to make a very good fit for that whole pattern of uh, fluctuations. Just a small number of uh, parameters describe our universe extremely well, provided you put in a lot of physics and supercomputing time to, uh, do the, to crunch the numbers properly, and provided you know how to insert some of the things Rather interestingly, some of the interior angles of a triangle is 180 degrees to very high precision, which is very odd since there's no particular reason why it should be. So something in the early universe forced the universe to be flat like a sheet of paper rather than curvy like a sand or a sphere. That thing is what we tend to call inflation. And uh, another fact that comes out, which I haven't stressed, is there are only three types of neutrino. That is, particle physicists can uh, stop worrying about the fourth neutrino, at least the fourth active neutrino. There could be some very boring neutrinos that only contribute to dark matter, or ones that only become active so early on in the universe that they can be lumped together as other Another fact, the fitting of the curve suggests that the cosmological constant is a perfectly good assumption for the thing that's causing the universe to itself. You're not required to say this cosmological constant is actually a cosmological field that is changing. That is a fundamental fact about our gravitational theory that has uh, repercussions for how we understand general relativity. And also tells particle physicists to stop worrying. You can measure the rate of collapse of clusters from the integrated sachs wolf effect, which is now right. This theory of inflation that's supposed to make the universe flat looks good, and it produces the right sort of pattern for early noise that could have grown to structure today. I should say, by the way, that the measurement of this parameter more precisely is a big aim of uh, travel research. There are a couple of things that don't work quite so well. The numbers of clusters that have been seen in the Planck data aren't the numbers that were expected early on. Well, that's because the early expectations were based on some wrong optical but they're also not uh, quite in agreement with what's found for, with contemporary X-ray observation searching for clusters and current optical observation searching for clusters. So there's a slight tension there. Another slight tension is that um, at low 
multiple number, there's a little bit more disagreement with uh, theoretical curves than you would suppose. Now that could just be that we're unlucky and we're not in a perfectly representative place in the universe, or it could be telling us that the universe isn't quite the shape we think it is. And a third embarrassing fact is that there's a pinball. And this is the pin. It's a part of the sky which is anomalously low in microwave brightness. Now, heights in microwave brightnesses and decreases in microwave brightnesses are entirely allowed, but within a range of values. And this one is slightly outside that range. Both W. Map and Planck agree that this thing exists. They disagree slightly about its shape and its amplitude both agree it's there. It could be a particularly um, strong integrated Satellite uh, effect type of thing. That is to do with uh, a void that's uh, expanded rather more rapidly than it should have done. But it could also be an indication that something funny is going on in that direction. There's another anomaly that I haven't mentioned called the axis of evil. So, I'll, I'll conclude with a few sort of more personal remarks. Um, as we go to more experiments in microwave background radiation, and there are going to be more, one of the things that starts to become more and more of a problem is the thing that was used early on to show that microwave background radiation is distant. That is, the Smirzo Bevich effect, this scattering of all brown clusters. Of course, if you go and look at the sky uh, very deeply, you'll find that in every direction you look, there's a cluster of galaxies staring you in the face. And there are galaxies within a few arc seconds of every line of sight you look along. If you go and look at the microwave background radiation, then each of those little clusters of galaxies that lies along the line of sight could be producing a little bit of Semyozabovich effect, which is going to tend to Use some of the signals you see. And uh, the picture on the right is a simulation we did some time ago showing what the sky looks like if you take an absolutely super duper uh, satellite, which is actually too big to look at really, at the moment, and uh, do a really long experiment on a patch of sky that's about 100 square degrees, which is not too coincidentally rather like the patch of sky that. What happens is that at very large multipole numbers, these Snyazdovich effects start to come in and dominate over the cosmological signal. The cosmological signal tends to tail off, although this curve doesn't take proper account of the effect of gravitational winds as we saw with the decelerator table. There's already about a 1% contamination of numbers from Snyazdovich as we go to finer and finer scale measurements, it's going to become more of a problem. You can get rid of it to some extent because it has a different spectrum, but it is becoming an issue. Well, the thermal effect has a different spectrum, but these two effects don't. The kinematic effect is um, to do with a cluster moving along the line of sight, because a moving scattering object tends to produce a slightly different scattering effect than the static one. And that also causes a microwave background fluctuation. More fun is what happens if the cluster is travelling across the line of sight. Because then, like um, deflecting a cricket ball, in one sense of moving the bat, the ball gains energy, and if you hit the ball on the back of the bat, it tends to lose energy. So, if a cluster of galaxies is moving across the sky, on one side it will produce a positive deformation, on the other side a negative deformation. These, these deformations of the brightness of the microwave background radiation, unfortunately, have a spectrum that is the same as the spectrum of the primordial fluctuations. And 
provide um, an impossible floor below which uh, it's going to be extremely hard to get in high precision microdata processing. Oh, it's a very distant floor. How about the future? Well, there are a lot of other experiments coming along to try to probe the structure of the universe even better by pushing this um, rather beautiful microdata tool really as far as you can. And the parameters that describe the universe are going to be measured with even more precision, no question. Or possibly, you may find that the current best buy model for the universe, the so-called Lambda CDM model, ain't going to work. And maybe there are some hints in the incompatibilities that something funny is going on. My bet is actually there aren't. And that those incompatibilities are to do with uh, very re small residual systematic errors in the measurements that will be resolved by doing a better set of experiments. We might be able to measure some more parameters, improve on the polarization measurements, and so see the effects of gravity waves in the very early be a measurement of how very early on any uh, lumpiness in the Big Bang resolved itself. Improved micro background data automatically gives you improved SZ effect maps and a larger satellite could see those SZ effects way beyond redshift too for various different reasons. And that would let us see very first phases of the growth of clusters in their atmospheres. And my personal hope is that uh, someday we'll get a decent measurement of kin kinematics in the observatory effect. It's currently a, a rough statistical measurement. And the very first measurements of my own effect, the Burton Shaw Gull effect, which is supposed to be this baton ball effect of deflecting photons from clusters moving across the line of sight. And on that hope, Thank you for your attention. <coughs> Certainly. For an amazing talk. I mean, this was, uh, I, I acknowledge that the, the last bit of the talk might have been quite difficult for a lot of people here for a public talk audience, but here's your chance. Um, I suppose we can have a few minutes of asking questions. We have a traveling microphone here. Please put up your hand if you want to ask a question. There's right at the back is somebody who's got the <coughs> jackpot, hit the jackpot right at the back. First question. Somebody who wants to give the microphone man a bit of exercise. <laughs> uh, hi. So one of my questions is, uh, in one of the plots you showed that uh, cosmic variance is one of the main sources of noise. My question was, how do you, how does one quantify something like this, our uniqueness of the position in the universe that we are in? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the early part of the question. Uh, how does one quantify cosmic variance, that number, how unique our position is with respect to the universe? Oh, what you do is you, um, well, the, the easy way to do it is to take a, a supercomputer and say, our universe looks like this. Suppose we made 100,000 other universes and put ourselves in the middle of each of them. How much different would they look as random samples of the best buy universe that we think we have? And then you find that uh, you get this sort of scatter just from randomly putting yourself down at different um, locations in these universes. So it's a theoretical calculation based on the idea that um, although Copernic has told us we're in no special place, it could still be in an unfortunate place. So the idea is that the universe is one, but you can, you can simulate yourself to be at different points of yeah, the universe. Yeah, you can be somewhere. Uh, and you could be somewhere. Did you have a second part to your question? OK. okay. draw the conclusion on the neutrinos being only three types? Um, how could you conclude the three types? 
that's based on the detailed shape of the, uh, the fluctuation spectrum. And to be honest, I've never bothered to look into that in enough detail to be able to give you a full answer. There's somebody here who's an expert who can probably tell you. But it's to do with that, that detailed shape. Neutrinos tend to cause the lumpiness to um, uh, be reduced by neutrino free streaming early on. So the, uh, the relative heights of those peaks change slightly according to the number of Evening, Professor. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first is, what does the rapid inflationary state uh, of the universe do to the uh, redshift of the radiation? Does it do anything? Well, the very rapid inflation in the very early universe is what serves to smooth it out and uh, take away the uh, any gross bumps to make the universe a relatively uniform planet. Uh, the end of that inflation period when the, uh, the field that's supposed to be doing inflation decays away provides the noise source that makes the lumpiness that then grows into structure later. The other thing that um, the inflation does, if you think of the universe initially being as curvy as a balloon and then you inflate the balloon enormously, then any little bit of it still looks very flat even if there is a large scale curvature that you've uh, managed to inflate away by pumping so that's what inflation does to it. That's most of what it does. Thank you. And second one is, uh, can we see beyond CMB in future? The, you can see beyond micro background radiation if you look in some other radiations that um, would not have, de would have decoupled earlier. The sort of thing that would have decoupled earlier is neutrinos. Now, neutrinos only interact with matter very, very faintly. And the last time neutrinos interacted strongly with matter was um, about a minute after the Big Bang. So if you imagine making a neutrino-detecting satellite and looking at the neutrino background, you'll get the same sort of picture of the lumpiness of the universe just a few seconds after the Big Bang. Wouldn't that be fun? However, not very easy to detect a neutrino. And the energies of the neutrinos would be those of a neutrino field, which currently has a temperature of about 1.98 Kelvin. So they're very low energy neutrinos. And to detect a neutrino with a lower energy as low as 1.98 Kelvin would be a formidable feat. I predict confidently that the first person that detects a neutrino background will get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, gravitational waves as well. I mean, <laughs> you could get gravitational waves from the big Yeah, bang. gravitational waves take the same. Has it. So I just wanted to uh, ask you for your perspective on the future CMB mission. You alluded to it, but uh, you know what we had in the past was while COBE was on, people were thinking of WMAP, while WMAP was on, Planck mm -hmm. was already there. But we don't seem to be in that situation now. I mean, there is no real big uh, CMB satellite. What's your perspective on Well, what the next be mission is going to be a BMO polar, polar imagery mission, undoubtedly, um, uh, provided it doesn't explode on board. That will tell us something much more about the polarization spectrum. The polarization information in the micro background radiation is currently an underused resource to provide uh, extra precision on the cosmological parameters. If you can measure the BMO polarization, not just the EMO polarization, have this handle on um, gravitational wave signal, the tensor mode, in the very early universe. And that would be wonderful. Uh, predictions about what the amplitude of that is say that it might be as much as, say, a tenth that of the, uh, the scalar mode, the, uh, the mode that we already see. However, that is based on extraordinarily optimistic assumptions. And that my prediction is that it's a lot flimsier than that, and that uh, the BMO satellites probably won't see it, they'll set much better limits on it. So we'll know something about the um, chaos or lack of chaos in the very early universe. Now, 
on a slightly longer time scale, there is fundamentally no reason why you couldn't build a micro vacuum telescope on the back side of the moon and use that to measure the micro vacuum radiation very much more precisely than uh, Planck or W map radio, both in terms of angular scale and in terms of sensitivity. So on the time scale of um, uh, 2050 or 2060, there's a reasonable chance of getting a much better measurement of the damping tail at the far end of the micro vacuum scale. On a slightly shorter time scale, you could launch a better version of Planck. As you know, Planck had some deficiencies in terms of uh, the performance of some of the detectors and um, in terms of the digitization error that came back to the signal. Uh, with improved satellite to ground communications, uh, improved detectors, and a larger telescope, uh, and probably rather better star tracking so that you know where the telescope is pointing against a little bit better, and with much improved ground testing, you could hope to do as much as a factor of 10 better, I think, on some of the um, parameters to do with the actual tail. So there's a, there is a prospect there, but uh, the next problem is persuading the funding agency that it's worth putting the money into that, and persuading roughly 5,000 scientists that okay. it's worth putting 20% of their careers into it. But Tarun, there is a, uh, there's a chance of an Indian mission, uh, ISRO, actually uh, getting involved in uh, uh, in one of the uh, cluster micro background uh, spin plants. Would you want to comment on that? Because you've, you've taken part in these discussions. Uh, uh, ISRO is uh, showing interest in uh, collaborating, a collaborative uh, uh, kind of venture with the ESA. Mm -hmm. and probably, you know, if something like that takes off, probably everyone would be involved. Uh, and that's something that we've just started uh, you know, sort of discussing. I think that's looking promising. I mean, ISRO is certainly keen on some mission oh like yeah. that. I think ISRO saw that it got a good deal of uh, positive publicity from Planck. And uh, for the next cycle of large missions, it's a good thing to propose. So, yeah, go for it. Great. Any other Make questions? <laughs> yeah, right. Actually, one of our friends who is uh, watching us live has a question. So we are actually uh, broadcasting this on YouTube uh, webcast live. And so we have a question from people who are watching us on the web. Yes, so the question is, if there are multiple interstellar dust clouds in our line of sight, then how is the absorption of radiation through these clouds is corrected? OK. The um, Dust clouds tend not to absorb very much in the microwave. A much bigger problem is they tend to emit. And the dust grains, uh, as they rotate, act a little bit like spinning um, radio antennae and will send out radio waves. And there's um, a phenomenon known as anomalous microwave emission that's believed to come from uh, dust clouds of that type in our own galaxy. So if there are intergalactic dust clouds, then a little bit of that radiation could be distorting the uh, micro background spectrum, uh, probably down in the uh, one centimeter range, one centimeter to um, a tenth of a centimeter. That's the principal place. Uh, up at the submillimeter peak, it is true there is more thermal type emission from those dust grains, which could um, uh, affect the shape of the spectrum there, which would affect slightly the uh, model of galactic emission that's used to correct for uh, our galaxy, and would uh, probably add more or less uniform noise to the, uh, uh, the overall CMD spectrum. Okay? Great. So it's getting cold on a dark night. <laughs> so let's uh, draw this wonderful evening to a close. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mark, for your scintillating talk, and thank you everybody for coming and spending so much time with us. And let's look forward to the next talk in this series, which will come up in February. Please look up, uh, uh, look out to the newspapers and also on our various YouTube pages, uh, sorry, uh, uh, pages on Facebook and, uh, and our YouTube channel where we normally uh, uh, announce these things. Thank you.
Thank you all for coming.